Keurig Green Mountain gets bought out for $13.9 billion on this consumer goods edition of Industry Focus. Greetings, fools. I am Sean O'Reilly, joining you here from Fool Headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. It is Tuesday, December 8th, 2015, and joining me to talk about a $13.9 billion K-Cup is the coolest cat in town, Mr. Vincent Shen. What's up, Vince? Uh, not much. Thinking about this deal right now and uh, how very lucky uh, some investors were, think Coca-Cola, and how very unlucky other Did investors you see? were. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about this a little later. Coca-Cola is actually recording a gain on the investment. Of, they invested like billions of dollars, right? They mm -hmm. made $25 million. Yeah, it, and this is a really they swung from a quite a bit of you know a significant loss to this yeah, eking out this so. really small game, but we'll get to that later. Uh, yeah, and actually before we dive into the obviously the big consumer goods uh, news of the week, the acquisition of Kira Green Mountain by JEB Group, um, also some big news out of Amazon. Um, mm -hmm. They announced that, and apparently my Prime subscription is about to get a little bit more valuable. So, <laughs> what's going on, real quick? Sure. Uh, so there were, had been rumors about this uh, over the past couple weeks, I think. Yeah. Uh, where people were basically uh, hearing that Amazon would be offering its own, um, or offering through its Prime TV service subscriptions to other well-known. Um, uh, video services, networks, premium networks, even, and then potentially selling like prepackaged bundles of its own to further the cord cutting movement, I guess. And that's been officially confirmed today with the company basically announcing its uh, streaming partners program. So, as part of Prime TV now, you can also sign up for subscriptions to networks like Showtime, $8.99. Stars eight ninety nine, Sundance now six ninety nine, Comedy Central stand up three ninety nine, a whole bunch of different uh, other yeah. you know, content. And those are sizable discounts, as I understand it, to what you would have to pay for a streaming subscription to Showtime or Stars, which is actually about eleven bucks. Yeah. So these are very decent prices. So saving a couple dollars per month, absolutely, if you do it through Amazon, and uh, there's definitely some some other perks there too. Um, now, this isn't be to be confused with Amazon's, they're just in talks to do this, but I wanted to point out, um, this isn't to be confused with Amazon's plans to try to get major networks to do a streaming internet service, to literally directly compete with cable channels. Oh yeah, so Ch cable companies, I should say. Uh, you know that there's of course some you know some of the rumors behind that as well. Still, you know we still haven't heard uh, any new rumblings of that. Uh, but at the same time, it, yeah, the it last... should definitely be noted that this streaming partners program yeah. does not include live television. Yeah, and uh, uh, my understanding, just the last I heard, was they had reached out to ABC and NBC and everything. But mm -hmm. it's kind of awkward because NBC is, of course, owned by Comcast, who doesn't want to lose the cable subscriptions. But on the other hand, and one of the reasons the uh, you know Showtime and Stars are probably doing a discount for the subscriptions that you know that's actually been announced. Um, Amazon Prime has 45 million members. Mm -hmm. That's that's a big enchilada. So I, I think that's what I would consider to be, uh, you know, the first major reason why networks would want to sign up for this streaming partners program. Because when you think about it, at first, uh, you know, I personally would be a little bit concerned when you have basic. Because the thing is here, and that Amazon mentions in the press release is that. They will be managing a lot of things for their video providers. So that includes uh, driving subscriber acquisition, uh, handling customer service, managing billing, uh, serving the content, obviously, managing compatibility across a lot of different uh, set top boxes and other devices. So you're really handing over the reins essentially to Amazon entirely, but you know the perks there are also, they are managing all of those things, right? Right. Uh, they are giving you access to what you said, about almost 50 million of its uh, Prime members, and uh, you know, the th I think another issue is that for a lot of these smaller services, uh, like Showtime has its own streaming service, right? The problem is that it's hard to break into that top three, four, five, where you already have right. Hulu, you already have Netflix, you have Prime TV, you have HBO Go. And if you're one of these small services to break into that, to get access to that same kind of subscriber numbers, this immediately puts you in a position to benefit from from that exposure with Amazon, of course. And uh, it'll be really interesting to see... Uh, 
just how many people sign up. They're offering a lot of free tri- free trials for every single network, so that you know these are obviously the costs are on top of your ninety nine dollar uh, annual Prime payment, but. It's on a monthly basis. It'll be really interesting to see, you know, what kind of numbers they get and how successful this is for Stars, even which and this is their first rollout of a streaming service at all, mm-hmm. and they're doing it in conjunction with this Amazon program. Cool. Well, before we move on to Curie Green Mountain, I wanted to point our listeners to the newly redesigned Focus.Fool.com. There you'll discover a special offer to join the Motley Fool's Stock Advisor newsletter for all industry-focused listeners. All Loyal IF listeners have access to a special discount on Stock Advisor that works out to $129 for a full two year subscription. Just go to focus.fool.com to take advantage of this offer. Once again, that's focus.fool.com. So, Vince, uh, Monday morning, I got a push notification from my Wall Street Journal app on my phone, and uh, my jaw quickly hit the floor. <laughs> Kira Green Mountain had been bought out. For ninety-two dollars a share, almost a hundred percent premium. It was like seventy something, because it was a fifty bucks before. Um, anybody see this coming? <laughs> yeah, a, a lot of a lot of people who were short the stock did not see it coming. I'll Game tell you over. Um, the, the the thing is, uh, I kind of want to approach this uh, in three kind of steps. So first, we can talk about some of the terms of the deal. The valuations based on the offer price that you mentioned, which was quite a premium, and we'll get to that as well. Then I want to talk about a little bit about the buyer, their strategic rationale, what this will mean for Keurig, and then I want to talk about some of the winners and losers, other winners and losers from this deal. Awesome. So first and foremost, I already mentioned the price, but let's just say it again, and then how much higher it was. Sure. Everything. Yeah. So just keep in mind uh, on Friday, December fourth, the Keurig shares closed at fifty one seventy. And on Monday, after the news, they closed at eighty eight eighty nine, which was up seventy. Uh, so there's a seventy two percent. Little bit of an arbitrage spread there, but nothing. So huge. the actual buyout price of ninety two dollars meant it actually comes out to about a seventy eight percent premium to that closing price, and it actually gets even higher. Uh, with data from Bloomberg, where they basically said this buyout represents the largest premium in history for the beverage industry for deals larger than five billion dollars. When you compare the purchase price with the twenty-day average price, right? And um, you know, because that twenty-day, when you use that twenty-day average, it actually comes out to like almost ninety percent premium That's, or something insane like that. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, you know, the stock already was. Getting battered this year. Well, I was about to say, down sixty one percent, fifty two week high, like one hundred and forty five. Oh yeah, actually, so it hit its high last November at one hundred and fifty dollars, over one hundred fifty dollars. So it has traded down. uh, It's lost two thirds of its value since then, only to it almost seems like that's the reason that the the buyer JAB had to pay up the ninety two because anything less than that, they would have been like. Shareholder lawsuits and all kinds of stuff thrown at the company. That that's po- that's true. Uh, but the thing is, you know, at the fifty one seventy from the Friday closing price, you know, it was trading about sixteen point six times, trailing twelve month earnings. And then yeah. when you look at the 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 offered purchase price of ninety two dollars, you're looking at about twenty nine point five times. Now, based on recent results, you know, for its uh, Keurig's fiscal year actually, you know, ended. Uh, at pretty much September, mm-hmm. and for the fiscal fourth quarter, you know revenue down thirty percent, earnings down fifteen percent year over year. For the fiscal third quarter, uh, revenue down five percent, earnings down twenty four percent, and then they were either flat or down slightly for the two quarters before that too. So that that obvious downturn resulted in some of the weak trading, but paying twenty nine point five times They're for paying. that for what you're seeing is trending down pretty into basically. An unsuccessful Cure 2.0 rollout, 2.0 rollout when they did not allow third-party pods and people went up in arms about that. Then you also have the pretty lukewarm reception to the Cure Cold, and I think again this was a very nice turn of events for people who probably are otherwise in the red for their Cure position. So let's talk about uh, a little bit about JAB Holding, sure. the acquirer, because one, I don't think anybody's ever heard of them. Two. Um, <laughs> They should have though, because they keep buying consumer brands. Um, and the other thing is, it almost seems like this deal at this price 
only could make sense for these guys. Uh, that's actually a, g- a good way to put it. Um, and I'm kind of glad you mentioned, too, the thing about this JB Holding Company being relatively unknown. And I think that's almost by design because, uh, you know, this is an investment firm, first of all, that uh, people should know. They manage the money of the Ryman family, which is a, one of the wealthiest families in Germany. I think when I checked their net worth overall, something like $20 billion. Uh, it's, the family's very private. Uh, they're known, f- uh, pretty well known for two things I thought were interesting also, is that uh, they do not get involved in the fa- in the business affairs, and they also that's very Buffett esque. And they also, uh, I think it was like when they turn eighteen or something along those lines, they have to basically sign some type of agreement where they promise to stay out of the public eye. So overall, this is a very private family, and. The thing is, JB previously has already really aggressively added to its coffee portfolio. So, kind of what you're talking about in terms of the valuation, what they're willing to pay, you know, when you look at JB's overall strategy, it starts to make a little bit more sense why they would pay that huge premium. Whereas before, they had already acquired brands like Pete's Coffee and Tea, uh, Stumptown Coffee Roasters, Intelligentsia Coffee, Caribou Coffee, um, even the parent of like Einstein Brothers Bagels. So, they're in this process right now of. You know where they've built themselves into the number two player in terms of the world coffee, or like packaged coffee market, which I think is already worth some like eighty billion dollars. You know, number one is uh, is I believe Nestle still, but this kind particularly of particularly in Europe. Yes, and this will narrow the gap. And you have to think about the fact that you know in two thousand thirteen, uh, JB purchased uh, I think it was uh, the DE Masters Master Blender. Uh, the coffee company for $10 billion. Then last year, they joined that with the coffee bill business of Mundell's International to create Jacob's Do Egberts. So, you know, they have this huge conglomerate now. And now, in addition to Keurig, where, you know, Keurig, I think, at least within the US, where it dominates, it has like 80 to 90% market share in terms of the individual pod market and like a 20% of the coffee market overall. You know, this narrows that so that, you know, I think. Uh, with net for Nestle now, they'll c- command maybe like twenty mid twenty percentage of market share worldwide, and this gives JB maybe high teens. So again, they're narrowing that gap. This is re- this is a big uh, strategic move for them to get access to Keurig's technology to their U.S. presence, which you know it, the the business might be you know weak temp- currently, but that doesn't mean that it's not an opportunity for them to roll out Keurig. Uh, brewers to Europe, where it currently does not compete at all, right? And just uh, just get a bigger, bigger almost, piece of that pie. I almost, I mean, there's a lot of things, and this is what I meant by saying that this deal at this price. I mean, they're paying a growth multiple for not a growth company right now. Mm-hmm. Um, only makes sense for them because all of a sudden they have a bunch of different coffee brands, and this is just one thing they could do. Uh, they could throw in some pods, and you already have 20 million Keurig machines installed in the United States. Yes. Um, and those pods are, that's, I mean, I think it's something like 80% of Keurig's revenues. I mean, that's where the money is. Yes. So to roll those out and actually give that, that business a shot in the arm alone, I mean, I, I don't know. That could be. Well, the, you know, even if you consider, you know, Keurig's had a lot of success doing these, uh, you know, kind of promotional partnerships. So, you know, they have their Starbucks coffee in the pods, and which may not last past this. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, with the new kind of competitive, uh, the new competitive landscape now, where Starbucks is competing directly a lot of JB's hold uh, a lot of their Pete's coffee brands. I mean, yeah. So whether that partnership continues, uh, we'll have to see, but. Oh, guess what? There's a whole new portfolio of brands now that uh, Cura can leverage into you know, new pot offerings, uh, new people or new customers to target, like we said, within Europe, for example, with these brewers. And uh, definitely a big opportunity there. Whether it's worth that, you know, almost 30 times trailing 12 month earnings for the purchase price is, is another question. Okay. So bring it back around. Who are the winners and the losers from this deal? Sure. Besides, the shareholders are obviously a winner. <laughs> so you know, ex- you know, we talked we talked a little bit about already, of, obviously, of for JB what their uh, strategic vision was for this. So excluding them, um, it, it did ha- still have a pretty surprising effect. So going back to who we mentioned earlier, we have 
Coca-Cola, right? So Coca-Cola made, a, uh, I think, a series of two investments where they're buying up a stake and partnering with Keurig on the Keurig Cold, that which happens to serve, you know, very famous. You can make Coca-Cola with it, right, at home. That was a what they thought would be a big selling point for the system. And uh, Coca-Cola had amassed, uh, I think, a 16 17% stake in Keurig. Yeah, they had uh, paid $1.25 billion for 10%, and then that started that huge run-up. And then they paid um, way more, like a way higher price, for the other 6 7%. Yes. And their dollar cost averaging is about, I think, 90 bucks, and they're making $2 yes. a share. So that, you know, that's what... Uh, you know that I calculated out as well. So you know their own almost 26 million shares, which is really funny when you think about it like this way. On Friday they were worth 1.34 billion dollars. On Monday they were worth 2.38 billion dollars due to that, unbelievable due to that trading activity. So you know their cost basis around 90 91 dollars. You know they went from being underwater almost a billion dollars to now being very slightly about, about 26 million dollars. You know. In the black on this investment, and the thing is, uh, Coca-Cola CEO Mutar Kent has mentioned that you know they they look forward to continue collaborating with JB. Um, I'm sure on the cold and other technology and devices and offerings. So um, it just seems like an op- an even bigger opportunity now potentially for Coca-Cola, where it's like, okay, let's leverage this not just in the U.S. Cool. So I almost wonder if Coca-Cola. We'll get catches to the wayside or something because JB clearly doesn't care about soda, and the cold hasn't gotten the greatest reception. But oh well. The I think part of their view just might be a little bit longer term in that okay, you know, the cold came out not that long ago, a couple months ago. It'll take some time to one like get those efficiencies to bring the price down honestly to a more reasonable point. Yeah. Right? It was because before it was offered at three hundred dollars. A lot of people were kind of scoffing at that initial price, but that will come down. The pod prices will honestly likely come down as well to a point where it sustains a better user yeah. base, like that twenty million that they currently have for the hot brewers. And other than Coca Cola too, there you know some other investors that got quite a bit of surprise were some of the the short sellers. So interestingly enough, um, you know for Keurig, their short interest increased from five point seven million shares at the beginning of two thousand fifteen. To between 15 and 16 million shares oh, man. in October and November. So that represents about 10% of Keurig's total shares outstanding. When for the SP 500 overall, the, high, the median short interest or something that would be considered high is around 2%. So the fact that it was at 10% just shows you how bearish. Um, yeah. you know, some of the activity, the trading activity had become. And uh, in particular, you know, David Einhorn at Greenlight, Greenlight Capital was one of the more well-known vocal investors shorting uh, this company. You know, he had a position in 2011 that he closed out in 2014, and he basically said, "All right, well, that was a pretty unsuccessful shorting experiment on our part." And then he he doubled down this year, and you know the. Price collapsed this year that like we talked about. It's down sixty percent year to date. Mm. Did really well for him. I think it was like his third best play in his portfolio. Only to have this happen. So he's still making money on the deal. I think his he shorter like it was like a hundred hundred two dollars yeah. something like that. But he just lost a huge huge gain. This otherwise. just speaks to how hard it is to short because technically those people weren't wrong. Keurig was not doing well. <laughs> well, t- t- really twice he. He kind of had the right idea, but you know he couldn't live out. He he basically couldn't survive through the position long enough to gain. Right. And there was a, a previous dip before this current one in those shares, but he just got very unlucky with with the boost now. Got it. Well, thank you for your thoughts, Vince. Thank you, Sean. Hopefully, we get another crazy buyout next week. Yep. And if you're a loyal listener and have questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. Just email us at industryfocus at fool.com. Again, that is industryfocus at fool.com. And as always, people on this program may have interests in the stocks that they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against those stocks, so don't buy or sell anything based solely on what you hear on this program. For Vincent Shen, I'm Sean O'Reilly. Thanks for listening, and Fool on.